Hi, welcome to Russian History of Russia. On today's menu, blonde blue-eyed Asians kicking Rus' ass, really pretty but fake golden hat, the decline of Kiev and Rus' ripped apart by its own princess. It's big, it's cold, it's full of gas and gold, it's 1200 years old but still never does its toll, we're Christians but not really Europeans but from Asia, we send the dogs to space and kill the Tsars on occasion, we drink sodas made from bread, eat our enemies and Kasha, and that's why it's so fun to study history. Russia. The previous episode left us at the end of the reign of Yaroslav the Wise in 1054, who divided the sweetest pieces of Kiev and Rus between his five sons, with many other relatives retaining power in smaller cities and principalities. And I mean, kudos to Rurik's heritage. Those guys had 99 problems, but a male heir was never one. So Yaroslav, unlike his predecessors, clearly left the oldest, Izaslav, in charge of both Kiev and Novgorod, and told the other brothers to obey him like they did their father. Soon, two Two out of five brothers died, and the remaining ones, Izislav, Sevalod, and Svatoslav, divided their dead brothers' stuff between them and formed a powerful unity, often known as the Triumvirate of Yaroslaviches or of Yaroslav's sons, that allowed them to sort of bully their less fortunate relatives, rulers of smaller Rus cities and principalities, occasionally taking their lands for their own, as well as fight off the invasions together, and boy did they need to, because there were a lot. After Yaroslav the Wise defeated the Pechenegs and whatever was left of them migrated northwest, their place was taken by the new kid in town, Polovce, also known as the Cumans. Polovce are a really mysterious and fascinating guys, by the way. While most sources suggest that they were just another Turkic people originating somewhere in Central Asia, a number of sources suggest that they were actually blonde, blue-eyed, and fair in complexion, which is pretty puzzling from the anthropological standpoint. Polovce already dominated huge territories in Central Asia, and Pechenegs exiting the stage allowed them to expand all the way west to the Black Sea to occupy the Russian steppe region Region in the south and start poking Byzantine, Hungary, and Rus. In 1061, their invasion and devastation of one of the three core principalities of Kiev and Rus, Pereyaslavl, that was ruled by the middle brother Sevalod, essentially began a war that would last for over 170 years. Fighting off Polovce became like the main entertainment for Rus for a really long time. That is, of course, until the Mongols made them friends for like a second, but we'll get to that in a couple of episodes. Despite the brothers' success of basically not cutting each other throats, individual growth and enrichment of cities all across Rus led to more and more turf wars between Yaroslav's sons and grandsons and cousins and all the other relatives. 1067 battle on the Nimiga River, for example, is considered to be one of the bloodiest of Kiev and Rus' internal conflicts. And it also happens to be the first written mention of the city of Menesk, where the battle pretty much took place, which might sound more familiar to you today as Minsk the capital of Belarus. The principality in question of the fight you already know, it's Polotsk, the one Vladimir the Baptizer of Rus visited first on his grand tour of rape and murder. Since 1044, Polotsk was ruled by Vsislav, Vladimir and Rogneda's great-grandson, and he was alright for a while until he started occasionally raiding neighboring cities that didn't belong to him. That's when in 1067 the three brothers kicked his butt on the Nemigar River, captured and imprisoned him in Kiev. They probably didn't feel too bad about it because he was the only ruling prince out there that wasn't a direct descendant of Yaroslav the Wise, but he would also become the only one of his branch of Vladimir's children to actually rule Kiev, even though very briefly. In 1068, Polovce plundered through the Pereyaslavl principality again and then crushed the three brothers' forces trying to stop the invasion, which all put Kievans at a really anxious mood. So when Izaslav, who just fled the battlefield, refused to rearm the Kievans so they can fight the Polovce back if they were to come for them next, they had zero chill about it. They rebelled against Izaslav, causing him to flee to his wife's cousin, Polish king Boleslav II. They freed the Polotsk prince Vseslav from his Kievan jail and proclaimed him the Grand Prince of Kiev, demanding that he protects them from the invasion. Luckily for both Vseslav and Izaslav, the younger brothers defeated the Polovce that year, allowing Izaslav to come back for his throne in 1069 with some Polish Senna's little helpers. However, the whole ordeal took toll on the whole brotherly love fest. When the news broke about Izislav approaching with his Polish army, Seslav fled to his Polotsk, and the Kievans justifiably concerned that Izislav might hold a bit of a grudge about the whole rebellion thing begged for help the two younger brothers, Sevalod and Svatoslav. They agreed to let the older brother back onto his Kievan throne if he promises to be nice and not, like, kill the Kievan rebels. He agreed, but then sent his son ahead of his army, who definitely 
did kill some rebels and blinded some other. The whole blinding routine, by the way, is gonna be like a thing throughout the next few centuries, so I hope you're into it. So Izislav took back Kiev and naturally went after Polotsk again. He initially succeeded and put his son there, but then Sislav came back and kicked the first son out, but then another son kicked Sislav out, and then like everyone was fighting. And then in 1073, the brothers had a complete falling out, with the younger two kicking Izislav out to Poland again, which was all so extremely badly timed because the Polovtsy came back and started the invasions again, and like nobody was having a good time. In 1076, the youngest brother Svatoslav dies in what is considered to be the first recorded unsuccessful surgery in Rus, a failed tumor removal. And just two years later, in 1078, the oldest brother Izislav died as well in a fight with his cousins, leaving only the middle brother, Sevalod, who declared himself the Grand Prince of Kiev and the ruler of all Rus and took his brother's lands. Sevalod was a rather confusing character. He had two Polovtsi wives and spoke several languages, Cuman or Polovtsi language being one of them. The Lavrentiev Chronicle says that he didn't drink and was really kind and god-loving, while the Primary Chronicle actually describes his rule as being super corrupt and unjust. And despite his initial success at stopping Polovtsi in 1068, he was actually really bad at the whole fighting thing, which was pretty much the only thing at the time. However, Sevalod had a son. Vladimir. Vladimir was given the province of Chernyagov, but stayed close to his father and fought a lot of battles for him, and even took over the governing in later Vsevolod's years clouded by illness. Vladimir was born of Vsevolod's first wife, Anastasia, who was a close relative to Byzantine Emperor Constantine Monomachos or Monomach in Russian, and the tradition allowed him to actually take his maternal name if it was of higher status, and that is why we know Vladimir II as Vladimir Monomach. However, when Vsevolod died in 1093, Vladimir did something unheard of. Instead of taking the Kievan throne, which he totally could, he supposedly said, if I take my father's throne, I will have a war with Svatopolk, son of Izislav, as it was his father's throne before. He spent the next two decades as the ruler of a huge chunk of Rus in the northeast often playing the role of the only unifying force that allowed Rus to stay somewhat united, at least against the attacks. In 1097, he initiated the Council of Lubitsch to hold the vote between the rulers and clean up the whole inheritance mess that was ripping the fabric of the state apart, really undermining any chances against the invaders. The results were a short-term success. In order to achieve the immediate somewhat peace, the council broke the Rota inheritance law that was in place for like two centuries. They locked the inheritance of Rus for each prince within the borders of their father's respective estates. That solved the immediate crisis, shutting down a lot of squabbles for contested lands, but it also predetermined the inevitable further fragmentation into individual state and principalities, always at each other's throats. However, when in 1113 Svetopolk II died, Kievans couldn't care less about the newly established inheritance logic. They wanted the hottest prince out there, the pacifier of petty fights, the crusader of policy, the one and only Vladimir Monomach. According to the legend, Vladimir initially declined the first invite and only agreed to the second one when he heard that Kievans got really upset and ransacked the noble's house, robbed the Jews, and threatened the monasteries. I mean, I'm sure it was the Jews for Vladimir. During his rule, his pristine reputation and universal respect were pretty much the only glue keeping the fragmented state together. Ironically, his victories against the Polovtsy diminished the unifying factor of a common enemy. As the threat continuously declined, so did the incentive to stay out of your cousin's stuff. Vladimir managed to keep Rus together up until his death in 1125, and for a few years after, so did his son, Mstislav. Vladimir's name is immortalized through a literary work that is attributed to him, Vladimir's sermon to his children, where he preaches temperance, veneration, kindness, hospitality, and other Christian values. His name is also linked to one of the most precious relics of the Kremlin treasury, the Monomach's cap or hat or crown. The way the legend had it was that his infamous grandfather, Constantine Monomachus of Byzantine, graciously presented it to him for being really awesome. The problem is, A, Constantine died when Vladimir was only two and b, the crown's oldest pieces are dated somewhere around 13th century, while the whole piece probably was created somewhere in the early 16th, which is when the legend was forged by Vasily III 
Emperor of Russia to justify his right to fill the shoes of his famous father, Ivan the Great. FYI, not Ivan the Terrible, that one would be his grandson. Anyhow, other than keeping his shit together and not having anything to do with a pretty golden hat, Monomach sounds like a really okay guy for a ruler, almost as if he occasionally put the needs of the state before his personal ones, at least according to the sources that we have about him. His son Stislav did more as a ruler of Novgorod while his father was still alive than in Kiev after, which only lasted for seven years until his own death in 1132. The centrifugal forces were already unstoppable. Rurik's dynasty grew to dozens of princes, all with claims to lands across Rus, especially now when the Lubich Council basically allowed them to lay claims to anything their fathers had ruled over. The final nail in the coffin came from the big brother that Rus both fought and depended on all these years, the Byzantine Empire. As Kiev's most important trade partner declined, so did the trade route from Varangians to the Greeks, and so did its main source of wealth. European crusades happening at the same time actually created new trade routes through the Mediterranean, which was so not good for business. One by one, Rus principalities defied Kiev, which is what we're going to explore in the next episode. The formation of kingdoms that will start looking way more familiar to you as modern-day countries of Ukraine and Russia, rise of the aristocratic Republic of Novgorod and the foundation of Moscow, Teutonic and Lithuanian knights crusading in Rus, and of course, the Mongols. See you then.